This episode is supported by Nanyang Vice. Nanyang Vice is one of the fastest growing and most well-received Mandarin horror podcasts in Southeast Asia. It focuses on urban legends, unsettling individuals, real crimes, and more. A unique movie-like thriller, the series puts you in the shoes of its protagonist, creating a terrifying auditory experience. Nanyang Vice frequently tops Apple Podcasts fiction list in Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, Malaysia, and Singapore. New episodes go up every Monday and Friday. Horror and ghost lovers, don't miss it. Ghost Maps Entry 60 Pulau Tekong, Singapore It's gonna be a long night. Still, as exhausted as I've been since my accident, there's no way I'd miss out on this time of year. I've said it before, but it bears repeating. The Hungry Ghost Month really inspires more people to share their stories with me. And while I try to steer clear of returning to places that I've covered before, sometimes I'll get enough stories about an area that justifies a revisit. Pulau Tekong is one such place. Out of the three interviewees I'm meeting with tonight, two of them are sharing their stories about the island. The last time I chronicled encounters on Tekong, it was courtesy of an elderly gentleman named Ben. Ben had related to me his experiences there from years before it was turned into a military training center. So, it's pretty fitting that this time round, the first of my interviewees is his grandson, Gary. We're sitting at a coffee shop in Bedok, each of us sipping on a warm cup of kopi. Gary, I note, looks a lot like his grandfather, and he smiles when I tell him so. <laughs> yeah, I get that a lot, he says. He tells me that it's not the only thing he's inherited from his grandfather. When I was a kid, Grandpa used to tell me about all of his encounters, he says. Dad disapproved, of, of course. He never really believed in that sort of thing. He continues, then adds with a laugh. And I think he also didn't want me to be scared out of my mind. Gary tells me that his grandfather's stories didn't actually scare him. Instead, they made him extra cautious when it came to the unexplained. When I was in secondary school, my classmates would go exploring at famously haunted spots, he says. But I'd always set out those little excursions. At first, Gary's classmates would call him chicken. But as each of these adventures ended with someone getting hurt or worse, his peers began to see the wisdom in Gary's approach. There's only so much you can do to avoid the supernatural, he says, especially in Southeast Asia. Ben's story about Pulau Tukong was ever-present in Gary's mind when he enlisted for national service. It's what kept me safe from what happened, he says, then apologizes for getting ahead of himself. I tell him it's fine and fish out my recorder before I ask him to start from the beginning. It was the Hungry Ghost Month in 2010. Gary hadn't passed his physical exam prior to enlisting for national service. That meant that he'd have to go through two weeks of extra training before he could even begin his basic military training. 
as much as I thought I was ready mentally, nothing can really prepare you for that drastic shift from regular old civilian to NS men, he says. What helped, however, was that he wasn't going through it alone. Gary shared a bunk with nine other enlistees. All of them were either just as or more nervous than him about national service. But that camaraderie didn't change the fact that every day for that first week ended with them feeling dead tired. Their bunk, Gary tells me, was thankfully located on the second floor, so it wasn't an arduous climb in the evenings. Still, all that exercising, all that regimentation. By the time their sergeant called for lights out, it usually took everyone mere minutes before they were fast asleep. Most nights, they'd all sleep through till morning. When they'd wake up, bleary-eyed, they then wondered where the night went. Most nights. It was the second Monday of their two weeks. Gary woke in the middle of the night and wanted to head to the toilet. But his grandfather's stories echoed in his mind. And countless other stories too. From previous generations of NS men that warned about going to the toilet alone. So, Gary looked around the unlit bunk, hoping to find someone else who wasn't fast asleep. That's when he caught sight of two of his bunkmates, Roger and Amali, heading out. Roger was supporting Amali, who was hunched over slightly, groaning and heaving. He sounded like he was going to throw up at any second, Gary says. Gary rightly assumed that the pair was heading down to their sergeant to get Amali to their medical officer. As they slowly walked out of the bunk, however, Gary noticed something odd. The shape of the shadows that they cast in the light of the corridor outside the bunk. It was close to what it should have been. Close, but not quite right. I would have chalked it up to my imagination, or my lack of sleep, or really just my urgent need to pee, he chuckles. Except the shadow. It came back into our bunk. The shadow was larger now. It stood at the entrance of the bunk and seemed to be looking around, looking for someone else to torment. Gary was frightened, but he was prepared. He slipped his hand under his singlet and pulled out the talisman that his grandfather had given him. A talisman of the sun deity. Grandpa told me how he thought the sun deity had protected him when he would visit the island in his younger days, Gary says. I'm not terribly religious, but at that moment, I felt the kind of comfort that only Grandpa had ever given me. That comfort would be short-lived. Even though Gary's bunk bed was the furthest from the door, the shadow had noticed his movements. It seemed to fly towards him like a large black bird of prey. Just as it reached the foot of his bed, However, it stopped. The shadow had no discernible features. It was just a shape of nothingness. 
Still, Gary felt like it seemed surprised. Then Gary felt its emotions change to anger and malice. Gary's towel was hanging from the frame at the foot of his bed. The shadow tossed it across the room petulantly, then seemed to disappear. But Gary knew it was still nearby. I had taken the bottom bunk of the bed, he tells me. The top bunk wasn't occupied, and that's how I knew where it had gone. The bed above Gary squeaked under the weight of something heavy on it. From the foot of that bed, Gary saw a pair of legs lower down. The pale legs of a child. The carefree laughter of a little girl filled the room. Carefree, but with a hint of spite. It was deafening, Gary tells me, shaking his head. But no one else seemed to hear it. The louder the laughter got, though, the tighter Gary held onto the talisman. I want to say that I knew that the talisman would protect me, that Grandpa wasn't full of tall tales, Gary says. But the truth is, what other choice did I have? As the night wore on, Gary was taunted by whispers from all around him. Two sweet whispers in a child's voice from the top bunk. Whispers from an older woman that sounded like nails on a chalkboard to his left. Growling hisses like that of some beast from the door. All of them mocking him. All of them saying the same thing. Your grandfather can't protect you. Yet, for all their taunts, Gary says, a wistful smile on his face, they never got any closer to me. Gary says that just before dawn, the shadow might have made one last attempt to break him. I hesitate to give it more credit than it deserves, he says. After all, I was seriously frazzled and sleep deprived by that point. The taunting whispers grew fewer and fewer the closer they got to sunrise. But just before they went completely silent, they seemed to be coming from the table in the middle of the bunk. Gary looked over and saw something on table. In the light of day, I could confirm that it was just someone's helmet, he tells me. But no one knew how it got there. And what more, in the darkness just before dawn, the helmet looked like something else. It was Gary pauses now, clearly still struggling with this. His face is scrunched up in a mix of sadness, fear, and anger. 
I tell him that he doesn't have to continue if he doesn't want to. But he silently waves me off. It looked like grandpa's head, he tells me, finally. It's his eyes, wide open, just staring at me. Gary says that he nearly ran to it. Nearly. He takes a deep breath and pauses again before continuing. I don't know how I resisted, honestly, he says. But he did. And soon, dawn's light crept into their bunk, illuminating the shape for what it was. Just a helmet, he says. Just, just a helmet. The first chance Gary had that day, he gave his grandfather a call. The elderly man was thankfully fine. He sounded relieved, he says his tone brightening up, even before I told him what had happened. The shadow never bothered Gary again. A few more of his bunkmates fell ill over the next couple of nights, but no one saw anything. And after those first two weeks, Gary convinced some of his bunkmates to bring their own religious items with them too. And after that, no one else fell ill in that bunk for the rest of their time on Tekong. When I told the rest of the family what happened, Dad was surprisingly quiet, Gary says, with a smirk at first, before his expression softens. I saw him talking privately with Grandpa later though. They chatted for a bit, and then he gave Grandpa a pat on the arm. Gary goes quiet, and we both sit in that silence for a moment. Finally, I tell him, with a smile, that he's clearly inherited his grandfather's gift for relating these types of encounters to. Oh, I know, he says with a hearty laugh. Why do you think he asked me to contact you? We talk for a little while more before Gary heads off and my next interviewee for the night arrives. If you want to discover more of Southeast Asia's other side, subscribe now and follow us on social media. You can also be one of our supporters on Patreon. Look for We Are Huntu or click the links in the description. Ghost Maps is a Huntu production created by Kyle Ong and Wayne Ray with art direction by Jolene Lim and recorded on Audio-Technica Mics.